Hey everybody, welcome back. So now today we are going to make our way back to India and talk about some empires. Uh, just to recap again, since it's been a while since we've been back here, uh, we talked about the Aryans. They came in, they took over for the people of the Indus Valley or the Dravidians. They had lots of kingdoms, they had lots of trade, and they really had somewhere near zero unity. There was not anything like what we would call an empire, anything like that at all. And that would change because the Indians met other people. As, as long as the Indians were kind of kept apart, if you will, remember in ancient India and Pakistan, the whole city statish type of thing worked for them. But then Darius I shows up in Bactria. And in Bactria, he, which is really modern-day Pakistan, he is able to conquer pretty much all of it. And all of a sudden, the Indians are now subject to other people, and they don't like it, but they're also seeing the influences of it. And then Alexander comes in, and he conquers all of that, plus some, uh, having a couple famous battles with the Indians, some of which he won, some of which said to be a draw, depends on who you ask. But when Alexander dies, immediately, we talked about this with the Seleucid Empire, that this area was kind of able to break away and there was a power vacuum and, you know, it was all going to be who's going to fill it. And the first guy to do that was a man by the name of Chandragupta Maurya. That's a picture of him on the right there. Chandragupta Maurya was a general from the kingdom of Magagda, and he kind of rose up through the ranks as a military leader, and he was able to eventually kind of overthrow the rulers in like a military coup, and at that point decides to form a dynasty. Now, the dynasty itself is relatively short-lived, about 140 years, but it's the first ever dynasty in India. So the first time we have dynastic rule. And he is going to go on a you know, really a campaign and take over much of India and expand into Pakistan, and his uh, sons and grandsons would follow him after that. Now, his government is really important. As you see, his empire here is in blue. Okay. And then his main successor, um, which I think is his grandson or his great-grandson, uh, Ashoka, who we'll talk about, will extend it all the way over here. And this would be one of the largest empires, in fact, one of the largest until the British. He had a big-time governmental aide, a man whose name was Kotalya, and Kotalya wrote the Arthashastra, and the Arthashastra was a government manual. And in we, we don't have a lot of writing on the exact form of government, but from the evidence we have, it was based on this book. And the book talked about the most important thing for a government to do was to control trade, agriculture, collect taxes, maintain order, and wage war. And so you, when you put all of those things together, if you think about it, it's really no different than today. And it was the whole idea of that you need to have a strong central government to do this. Now, it doesn't really say what type of government to have, but those are the things that a government needs to run successfully. And if you think about it, you know, the idea of trade, food, taxes, order, and war, I don't know, it's pretty much everything. So this was hugely influential, and most of the later uh, empires after him, um, after Chandragupta, would do this type of stuff. But the key ruler of the Mauryan dynasty was Ashoka. He was a guy that was able to, as you see if we pop back real quick, have a ridiculously huge empire. But something very interesting happened under him. As he was expanding the empire, the last group that he conquered were, uh, were the Kalingans. And he heard that his army had defeated them, and he had a huge army of anywhere from 150,000 to 200,000 men, and it was absolutely incredible. But he heard in taking Kalingans that he had killed 100,000 of them and then driven another 150,000 of them from 
their home. And he basically had a moral crisis and was like, oh my God, what have I done to these people? And one of the big things that he did as a result of that is he actually converted to Buddhism. Now we'll be talking about Buddhism a little bit later, but it is Ashoka is crucial for the spread of Buddhism. You see, Buddhism started about 250 years before Ashoka and had actually almost died out. But because he decided to be now a man of peace and religion and contemplation, Ashoka adopts Buddhism. Then he starts to spread Buddhism. He sends missionaries out all over the world. And it's really Ashoka is one of the reasons why Buddhism is a prevalent religion today. Now, he also, though, he did have a ridiculously huge army, and this is one of the earliest uses of elephant cavalry. Uh, the North Africans under Hannibal would have it too, but it is pretty incredible that you would, you know, I mean, what are, what are you supposed to do against an elephant? I mean, it's basically run. Okay, so this army was legit. Uh, the other big thing here, this is a stupa. A stupa is a place of worship for the Buddhists, and he would build these all over the place. Actually, this is the stupa in which Ashoka was buried, so it was very, very important to him. Now, Ashoka was crucial for a couple different reasons. One, he built lots of cities. Uh, Pataliputra is the main thing for it, and he really, after his conquering, became all about trade and trade and trade some more. Uh, what you can see there, that map on the left, you can see here, this is kind of where Pataliputra and then there's a city called Taxila, which were the center, and what they would do is trade all the way out. They have question marks because we're not exactly sure how far they went, but this again will be another key aspect of the uh, Silk Roads, which of course, as we said, the Sassanids would help explode about 600 years after him. But nonetheless, you have this focus on trade and economics. Um, he was also big on bringing in foreign people. This is when you'll start to see India influence the rest of the world, and we'll get to that later. But they set up cities for people. They actually had uh, organizations that were created so that people would be taken care of that were brought into the country to make sure that everything went well. He also set up a complicated bureaucracy. He had lots of governors. He put the best people in charge. He had uh, a central treasury, like central tax collection. It wasn't up to like random guys to do tax collection. They all worked for the government, much like the way we do it today. And the big thing that he did is he did laws, and he wanted everyone to know the laws. And so he built these pillars, kind of uh, Hammurabi-esque, that much of them have the laws on it, okay? But these pillars were made to kind of let you know that you were in the land of Ashoka and that you were going to follow his rules and he would make sure that everything was known. It really was an incredible, incredible uh, empire under him. Unfortunately, over time, it's going to fall. I don't have any real cool pictures of the fall of the Mauryan Empire, but you know, that looks like it hurts. And it did. It fell apart. You had bad leaders, they wasted their wealth, and they basically just collapse. They would eventually be succeeded by the Kushan Empire. And the Kushan Empires were nomads! Yay, we get the nomads! And then these nomads actually decide to sit down. Okay, the Kushan Empire is right here in green, and we have the Parthians. So we just talked about the Parthians uh, the other night, and now you see who was around the same time as them from about the year 30 to 375. Uh, their key leader was this guy, Kanishka, who ruled from 78 to 103. And once again, they were all about trade. Um, they would expand trade, they would foster trade, and then also they were like, uber smart in that they were nomads. They knew that nomads, you know, that nomads could cause them problems. And so they went out and took care of the nomads so they couldn't get or cause any more problems for them. So it really was kind of an incredible 
uh, culture here. We don't know a ton about them. I mean, they did pretty well for themselves. Uh, the problem for them is that, you know, um, after about, you know, 270 years, the leadership was kind of weak. Other noble families were looking to... Um, get their own power, so they started to have some problems, and then eventually they would get taken over by the Guptas. Now here are some coins of the cushions, here are some sculptures done by the cushions, many of them were Buddhist, so that also helped. But it was the Guptas that took them over, and they were a new empire that would start up in uh, central India, and then rise up out of there. And yes, the founder of the Guptas was Chandra Gupta. Not to be confused with Chandra Gupta, because why would you confuse Chandra Gupta with Chandra Gupta? I, I know, it's crazy. I don't know how they developed the names, but Chandra Gupta Maurya created the first dynasty and the first empire. Then you have the second empire, which was the Kushans. Now we have the third empire, which the Guptas. Uh, the Guptas were absolutely huge. As you can see there, they create a very large empire. They dive very deeply into Pakistan. Um, their main leader was Chandra Gupta. And then you have the leaders, as you see here in your notes, Samundra and Chandra Gupta II. Um, they really are going to build fantastic cities. And unfortunately, though, they decide to go feudal. Now, I know we say, oh, no, but somehow in, in India, they, they managed to actually make the feudal government kind of work for a while. The taxes didn't really seem to be that great, but it, it seemed like everything was fairly in working order. And that was a lot of respect for the king because those first three kings, Chandragupta I, Samundra, and Chandragupta II, were like really good kings. And so they set a great... Um, what's the word I want to look for? They set up a, a, a great system and a great appreciation for the king. So as a result, it was, you know, a little bit better. Um, and this empire was known for being incredibly safe. There was a Buddhist scholar that said that people could travel, that there was little crime, and everything was, you know, really, really you know, great and efficient and happy. And then my God, the nomads just come back. They come back over and over again. And here are the Hephthalites. Uh, they are better known sometimes as the White Huns, perhaps because of their skin tone. We're not really 100% sure. But the Hephthalites come in and, and they, you know, they do what nomads do. They really destroy everything as I hop back here. Sorry about the glitch. Uh, they do set up some uh, empires on their own, but what you end up having is that India will go back to kind of these Rajas and the Hephthalites. They, they really just destroy everything. So the Gupta Empire really had a lot of potential here. They, you, know, you were looking at maybe some really great expansion, but they really only lasted for about 150 years or so until these guys came in and they just wrecked it. So it was just a shame, and, and we're going to come back to them much later because they will be heavily influenced by both the Muslims and that eventually John Green's friends, the Mongols, will come by and really change it up. So again, here we go. We got another video in the books. Make your comments, write your questions, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.